Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And again, as always, greetings to our friends watching live on the web and later on podcasts. I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute, and it is my great pleasure to have all of you with us today. We are nearing the end, as we keep joking, about the season. We kind of run on an academic calendar. I think today's speaker and topic would attract a crowd no matter what the date, but I am delighted to have Carrie M. Stein, Commissioner from Securities and Exchange Commission, with us today to give a major new speech. And we look forward to an open discussion with her following her remarks. Um, just to go right in, because this is about substance, Ms. Stein was appointed by President Barack Obama to the SEC and was sworn in just a little less than a year ago, early August 2013. From 2009 to 2013, she was staff director of the Securities, Insurance, and Investment Subcommittee of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. All these committees and subcommittees have too many names, but that means she was really important on the issue she's about to talk about. Um, she, of course, played an integral role in drafting and negotiating several key provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act and also the Consumer Protection Act. She, uh, as staff director for that Senate Banking Subcommittee, she was, in fact, in charge of the subcommittee that had primary jurisdiction over the SEC. Previously, she had worked on the staff of Senator Jack Reed as his legal counsel and senior policy advisor. From 2007 to 2009, she was both the minority and majority staff director in the Senate Banking Subcommittee on Housing and Transportation, which is easier to say but less interesting. Um, and prior to that, had also been legal counsel Senator Reed. She has many distinguishing marks, including having been an advocacy fellow with the Georgetown University Law Center, an assistant professor at the University of Dayton School of Law, where actually one of my college classmates did the talk and is a double Yale with a BA and a JD from Yale Law School, which as a double Harvard D, I will withhold comment. Um, joking aside, um, clearly Commissioner Stein is someone who has been working in the weeds and in the crops of the financial regulatory reform effort of the last several years, and her appointment to the commission brought someone with real expertise and engagement to continue the work at the SEC, and we look forward to her remarks today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Adam, for the kind introduction. I'll try to, I'm height challenged, so they've given me a stool here, but I'm going to have to just thanks. I want to thank the Peter, Peterson Institute for International Economics for hosting me with you today. And I wanted to say to Adam, my speech today is going to touch on something that you spoke about recently with respect to the Fed. You stated that the Fed should be aggressively using all its tools to promote financial stability and not just focusing on interest rates. So I agree. And I would also expand that to include other financial regulators, including the SEC. Before I begin my remarks, I need to make the usual disclaimer you might have heard from SEC commissioners uh, that the views I'm going to express today are my own, do not necessarily uh, reflect those of the commission, my fellow commissioners, or the staff of the commission. I, like all of you in this room, uh, believe that we need to have strong, vibrant capital markets if we want to have a healthy job-creating economy. And our capital markets must be built on a foundation that is strong enough to withstand the next storm. During the Great Recession, we started a discussion about how to help insulate us when the next crisis comes. The next financial crisis may come from any direction. It's unlikely to come from the one we had before. And my job is to help figure out where the next crisis may come from and how to minimize the damage it might cause. That means we must identify systemic risk ahead of time and mitigate them. Today, we've convened this conversation and to discuss what the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission 
can do better to prevent the buildup and transmission of risk that can take down our entire financial system. So I'm just going to give you a quick roadmap of what I want to talk about today. I want to talk quickly about how we got here, and then I'm going to focus on three key areas where the Securities and Exchange Commission can play a critical role in addressing systemic risk. First, we need to think outside of our silo, and we need to think broadly and cooperatively with our fellow regulators, both domestically and internationally. Second, we need to focus on improving the stability, resiliency of our short-term funding markets, including securities lending and repurchase agreements. Third, we need to reevaluate how we think about capital, leverage, and liquidity with the financial institutions and the funds that we regulate. With the financial crisis now in the rearview mirror, many of us are starting to forget the forces that converged in 2007. Some even deny, which I find hard to believe, <laughs> the impact of the recession, optimistically viewing our financial markets and our economy as having been inoculated from a virus that spread quickly and wreaked havoc on the global economy. Yet studies continue to demonstrate that this recession continues to affect both attitudes and behaviors. A recent survey found that the generation entering the workforce now, the so-called millennials, age 21 to 36, have the same fiscally conservative views that the generation that exited the Great Depression had. Millennials are skeptical of the financial markets, and they're skeptical of long-term investing. And yet we are all going to increasingly depend on them to invest and drive our economy. I, like the millennials, am crisis-scarred, and I share a dream with the millennials. I dream of never facing another financial crisis, and I want to do my part to make sure that we avoid another one. Unfortunately, the events of 2008 are indelibly etched into my memory. In 2008, while I was working for Senator Jack Reed, our country's economic leaders began closed-door briefings with members of Congress. Concerned about the unfolding crisis, the chair of the Federal Reserve and the secretary of the Treasury came in and pleaded for help, and pleaded for an unprecedented financial intervention to stave off another Great Depression. They wanted tools that they said would help protect our nation from an invisible force that came to be known as systemic risk. A comprehensive strategy was developed to stabilize our economy and unlock the credit markets to save our financial system. But those were really scary days, with millions of American jobs and billions of dollars on the line. And huge policy choices had to be made with imperfect information, with consequences that would shape the world's economy for years to come. I'm not surprised that books by some of the participants like Sheila Bear and Tim Geithner and Neil Borofsky have been uh, selling so well. Many of you, like me, were doing everything you could to help. And we did accomplish a lot. The congressional battle over the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which we know is TARP, tends to be what people remember the most. And I certainly remember looking at a three-page document authorizing the expenditure of several hundred billions of taxpayer dollars with almost no strings attached. One does not soon forget documents like that. And policymakers had to make monumental decisions within a matter of days. And TARP was just a small piece of the picture. We also had to deal with frozen funding markets. Financial institutions were struggling to meet daily obligations. And overnight rates jumped from one day to the next. And ultimately, it appeared that no bank wanted to do business with another. So ultimately, the uh, lender of last resort stepped in. The Fed eased its own rules, expanding the ability of firms to tap the discount window 
and created several unprecedented programs to support the largest financial institutions to help borrowers and investors in the credit markets, markets I know that the SEC largely oversees. The Fed also created a slew of programs uh, to help the, the, the investors in the credit markets uh, in the area of commercial paper markets, money market mutual funds, and asset-backed securities. Trillions of dollars were pumped into our credit markets. And the, the commission didn't have the authority or the money to do that. It was the Fed who did that. But the markets and the institutions we oversee were saved by these efforts. Shortly after these emergency actions were taken, Congress began to work on what ultimately became the Dodd-Frank uh, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. My colleagues and I spent thousands of hours researching and trying to understand the causes of the crisis, having hearings, and trying to figure out how to address them. And then, just after 5 a.m. one Friday morning, it was done. The finished product was one of the most compre it was the most comprehensive piece of financial legislation we'd had since the Great Depression. And it contains several important substantive reforms to address systemic risk. First and form foremost, it restored regulatory oversight of the derivatives markets, which had played a huge role in AIG's collapse and provided kindling for the brewing financial firestorm. Second, it restricted banks' ability to engage in proprietary trading, which had magnified bank losses during the crisis. Three, it prescribed new rules for asset-backed securities and the mortgages that went into them, which were at the heart of the crisis. The Dodd-Frank Act also created a council of regulators, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, to identify and address systemic risks. And it created a new research group, the Office of Financial Research, to help. The point of both of these was to break down regulatory, regu regulatory silos and encourage all of our regulators to engage in lateral thinking. Next month will mark four years since the passage of Dodd-Frank, and I do think it's fair to ask how we're doing on the systemic risk front. To put it charitably, I'll say the answer is mixed. We've made some headway. The FSOC is meeting regularly, and the Office of Financial Research is up and running with over 200 staffers. The Volcker Rule is now final, and the largest banks are submitting resolution plans to, sure, to ensure that they don't collapse into a disorderly mess. Unfortunately, However, far too many of the substantive reforms mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act are not yet implemented. Derivatives reforms, for example, are in a legal limbo at the CFTC, and the SEC still has a long way to go. Credit rating agency reforms remain to be done. The controversial swaps push-out provision hasn't gotten off the ground. And the mortgage rules on risk retention aren't finished. And the rules to ensure that bank executives don't have pay packages that encourage excessive risk taking haven't been completed. So many of the most important systemic risk reforms in the Dodd-Frank bill aren't done. We need to finish these rules now. We can't afford to wait. However, finishing the Dodd-Frank rules, which largely addresses the last financial crisis, won't extinguish our new responsibility to think about and address emerging systemic risk. We need to continue to work with our fellow regulators to identify and address systemic risk in whatever form they arise in. Within the United States, that discussion should start with the FSOC. I've been pleased to see the hard work and the dedication of this council 
including their must-read annual reports. I'm disappointed, however, to see that the FSOC suffers from much more squabbling amongst regulators than it should. The point of the FSOC was for regulators with expertise in particular areas to identify potential risk and enlist the help of the entire council to address them. The intention was to get each regulator to become more resourceful and to start thinking in new and different ways. While some of that may be happening, in other cases, members of the FSOC are merely trying to dictate to or control regulators with primary jurisdiction over certain areas. The FSOC needs to come together <laughs> as a team, focus on the issues at hand, and provide mutual support. And I fear that individual members defending their jurisdiction detracts from the FSOC's critical mission to promote financial stability for all of us, for the entire economy. As a commissioner at the Securities and Exchange Commission, I see a staff every day that has a deep expertise and understanding of the capital markets. They are the best in the country at what they do. If the FSOC is going to be successful, it needs to take advantage of that expertise. But at the same time, the Commission needs to welcome and benefit from fresh eyes and different ways of thinking that can come from other regulators. It's disturbing that members of Congress and reporters have been inquiring about the level of cooperation between the SEC and the OFR regarding a report on potential sources of systemic risk. We should be above all of this. The FSOC's mission is far too important to be bogged down in a regulatory turf war. We all share a common purpose to make sure that the foundation of our financial markets is strong so it can support a strong and thriving economy. Although systemic risk has not traditionally been a focus of the SEC, it is now. And we need to embrace that mission and that responsibility. Without a doubt, the firms and the markets we regulate contribute to systemic risk in a number of ways. We need to do more on this front, and we need our federal regulators' help. Unfortunately, at times, the dialogue has not been particularly helpful. For example, consider the term that some regulators use to describe our, our funding markets, our capital markets, shadow banking. It paints a picture of shady activities taking place under cover of darkness and outside of view. This is a misnomer. Banking regulators may not have focused on some of these activities much in the past, but I can assure you that the SEC and others have been paying close attention to the funding markets for decades. What's more, some even go further and suggest that these markets are unregulated. Again, a misnomer. While the primary regulators of these markets, including the SEC, need to enhance oversight, need to modernize rules, it cannot be said that nothing has been done. If you strip away the inflammatory language, and you focus on the substance, I think there's a lot of potential for progress. Which brings me to the second point I'd like to talk to you today about short-term funding. The short-term funding markets are big and interconnected. The collapse of these markets during the crisis was profound. Money market funds experienced runs. The commercial paper markets dried up. Securitizations and conduits stopped completely in their tracks. And firms suddenly demanded more and more collateral and better collateral to support securities lending and repos. Our short-term funding markets are important and they have their benefits. Money market funds and other investors 
can purchase short-term funding obligations and make higher returns. And broker-dealers can fund their positions very cheaply with high-quality collateral. At the same time, short-term funding for long-term obligations can create serious problems. What happens if I use a credit card to buy a car? Well, if I get an introductory rate of 0%, sounds like a good deal. But if the 0% rate spikes after 12 months, it goes up to 25%, to 36%, then I've got a problem. Our short-term wholesale funding markets are not that different. Except unlike my credit card, I don't know when the interest rate might spike or if my lender might demand full repayment. Ultimately, it's an over-reliance over on short-term funding that may accelerate credit supply and asset price increases in the good times. But it may also accelerate precipitous declines in asset prices and credit in the bad. I can assure you that the Commission is working hard on rules to prevent runs on money market funds, and I think every one of us wants to get it right. There have been a lot of discussions about capital, insurance, floating net asset values, redemption fees, gates, and restricting uh, sponsor support. And each of these tools has its pros and cons. For example, if there are fees and gates, couldn't this possibly trigger preemptive runs by investors that otherwise would not have occurred? Or will fees and gates actually reduce the run risk? We've seen very uh, good arguments by sophisticated firms and economists on both sides of this issue. In short, is it more likely that gates and fees can cause or exacerbate the crisis? or that fees and gates can actually prevent or stop one. And what happens to borrowers when the money fund providing their short-term financing slams its gate down? Will the money fund decline to renew their repo arrangement? And does that impact not just this borrower, but the rest of the short-term lending market or the entire financial system? In an industry that is this important to our financial system, we should be very confident in the answers to these questions before moving forward. But money funds are only one small piece of this picture. And while I hope we're able to finish a rule soon, a money fund rule will only address a part of these issues. It, will, it would only address the lenders, in effect. Uh, we also need to address the borrowers and their intermediaries. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and others, including the Commission, have been making progress. For example, the clearing banks' intraday credit exposures in the tri-party repo market have been dramatically reduced. The Financial Stability Board's work stream on securities lending and repos has also been, been putting forward some great ideas, including collecting more data enhancing disclosures, and imposing meaningful discounts. But borrowers who rely on short-term funding should be required to disclose to their investors the relative maturities of their obligations. If a borrower becomes too dependent on short-term funding, its lenders may demand more collateral, higher interest, or restrict their access to funding altogether. This is how efficient markets should work. So now I'd like to talk about my last topic, which is capital, leverage, and liquidity. And I think we need to revisit and enhance some of the Commission's rules in this area. But before I talk about some of my uh, suggested potential improvements, I first want to define what we're talking about. Capital, in my mind, is generally the amount of sticky funding for a firm, which can be used to absorb losses. Contrary to some commenters, capital is not a reserve of assets, like a savings account stored for a rainy day. Capital is merely a source of funding. The purest forms of capital 
are equity shareholder contributions and retained earnings. They have the most loss absorption capacity. Yet over time, other supposedly sticky funding, such as subordinated debt from an affiliate, have been allowed as capital by some regulators, including the SEC. Because I assume most of you are not SEC historians, let me take a moment to talk about the SEC's historical approach to capital. Since the 1930s, the SEC has had broad powers to regulate the financial responsibility of broker-dealers, which we've always considered from the standpoint of investor or customer protection, not systemic risk. Today, the Commission's primary capital requirements for broker-dealers come from Rule 15C31, which we call commonly the net capital rule. That rule generally requires broker-dealers to value their securities at market prices and then apply discount to those values based on each uh, security's perceived risk or haircuts. These values, after the discounts, are then used to compute uh, the liquidation value of the BD's assets. The general goal is to ensure that a BD holds enough in liquid assets to pay off all of its non-subordinated liabilities while still being able to meet its obligations to its customers. So our focus has been on providing adequate time for the firm to liquidate in an orderly fashion without the need for a formal proceeding or financial assistance from SIPIC, which is our Securities Investor Protection Corporation. By contrast, prudential regulators have long relied on capital and leverage restrictions to actually prevent a firm's failure. That has not generally been the goal of the SEC's capital regime. Rather, the SEC's capital regime has historically been somewhat agnostic as to the actual failure of the firm, focusing instead on ensuring the return of assets to the firm's customers. This disparity in historical objectives may be a part of the confusion. I say historical because I believe that the SEC should consider whether it too should be focused on preventing the collapse of systemically significant firms. Given the systemic risk posed by some of the firms we regulate, I think it's about time for the SEC to revise its reasoning for imposing capital requirements to reflect not only our historical objective to protect the firm's customers, but also reduce the risk to the entire financial system of a large BD's collapse. What's more, in 2004, the SEC amended its net capital rule to establish a new method for calculating capital for the largest BDs, the very biggest. The change was in line with Basel expectations at the time, and it allowed the largest firms to rely more on their own modeling, including value at risk and scenario analyses. And the commission, like other regulators, set up a few, and I would argue not enough, requirements for these models. So, when we let broker-dealers use their own models, what do you think happened? You guessed it. The models led to less capital. I'll save for another day discussions about uh, risk modeling uh, in the London, uh, London Wales scenario. In fact, even when we adopted this alternative net capital regime 10 years ago, the commission noted that, quote, a broker-dealer's deductions for market and credit risk probably will be lower under the alternative method of computing net capital than under the standard net capital rule. In return for exempting these large BDs from the established calculation method, their holding company had to acquiesce to commission supervision. So why did the SEC do this? after 60 years of arguably effective capital regulation. The adopting release 10 years ago stated it pretty clearly to, quote, 
reduce regulatory costs for broker dealers. But reducing these regulatory costs was ultimately accomplished at great cost to the BDs, to investors, to American taxpayers, and to our entire economy. While the SEC may have been agnostic as to whether its regulations should help prevent a large firm's collapse in the past, we cannot afford to be agnostic now. As part of our analysis, we should also think anew about what constitutes capital. While the SEC has recognized, recognized that, quote, net capital should be permanent capital and not merely a temporary infusion of funds from an affiliate or other sources, we also have historically allowed subordinated debt from an affiliate to count as capital. Given the needed shift as to why we require capital, we should consider whether it is still appropriate to count the, the subordinated debt uh, from an affiliate as capital. Considering what we know now, the current treatment is quite troubling. Counterparties to a BD may cease to do business with it or significantly alter the terms if they learn that the BD is undercapitalized or otherwise in financial distress. And their concerns are not likely to be assuaged by debt provided by the BD's affiliate. Why? Mainly because counterparties would likely want to avoid legal disputes over repayment uh, priorities, especially after a crisis. If that's the case, then the BD's compliance with our net capital rule, may still leave it at risk of a run. This, of course, can create a liquidity crunch that threatens not only the BD's viability, but that in turn threatens the viability of other firms, creating contagion that can spread quickly to other parts of the financial markets. In the same vein, I think it's past time to require some meaningful minimum haircuts for all types of securities lending and repos in our net capital regime. It simply doesn't make sense to argue that even high quality assets have zero risk. This defies lessons learned from the last financial crisis and it defies basic principles of finance. Yet the current rules allow that. We need to address the stability and the resiliency of our short-term markets comprehensively. And I hope you'll join me in that effort. And to be clear, this isn't just about capital. It's also about liquidity. If a firm doesn't have enough liquid assets to meet its obligations to counterparties in solvency, is not the only issue. Even if a firm remains solvent, that doesn't mean that it has adequate liquidity to weather a financial storm. To put it bluntly, <laughs> the collapse of Lehman Brothers was at least as much of a liquidity problem as a capital one, and it affected many other players in the market and around the world. We must also keep a close eye on other market participants that can cause and transmit systemic shocks. In particular, we should closely monitor investment funds, such as large hedge funds, that may be highly levered and interconnected to other players in our financial markets. The risk posed to our financial system by these funds are not new but they are constantly evolving. The SEC, as a primary regulator over the advisors to these funds, should be monitoring these risks closely, along with our fellow regulators. While Form PF should help in this effort, we should also be eager to ensure that all of our regulators have the data needed to identify 
and understand these major market participants and the roles they play. And if we determine that additional me measures are necessary to mitigate systemic risks posed by the largest participants, we should adopt them. The SEC needs to examine our capital leverage and liquidity requirements and modernize them to reflect the current funding ecosystem and our post-crisis understanding of systemic risk. As Adam said, I've been at the Commission for a little less than a year, and we have done quite a bit in that time. But in my view, the SEC can and must play a larger role in addressing systemic risks. We need to be working more closely and effectively with both the FSOC and the OFR. We need to be improving the stability and the resilience of the short-term funding markets. And we need to update and enhance our approaches to capital, leverage, and liquidity for our largest firms and funds. These efforts should not attempt to wring risk out of the capital markets, but we should instead be focused on strengthening the fabric of our entire financial system. In many respects, this is new territory for the Securities and Exchange Commission, but I believe we'll be up to the task, and I'll rely on all of you to hold us accountable. We all have a vested interest in the outcome. Thank you for coming this afternoon, and I look forward to taking a few minutes to discuss these issues with you. Thank you, Commissioner Stein. That was exciting, especially for those of us who care about systemic risk, which of course should be all of us. And I do want to, though there's obviously a lot of room for agreement, disagreement, discussion on some of your specifics, I do want to be on the record commending you for saying that the SEC has to go past its historic mandate and think about systemic risk as part of the broader integration of the regulators in this country. And it is good to have someone who still feels the passion of not losing track of what happened to our economy, our society in the last few years. I'm going to open it up. You have graciously offered to take on the record questions. Um, I will open it up in a minute, but just let me pose two to you, if I could. Um, in a sense, there, you can always say if systemic collapse of the kind we had in 2008, 2009 was so bad that any cost was worth it. I know that's not the argument you're making, but I'm just saying. We, we, the issue becomes what costly premia actually directly help will pay off. And so I guess what I would wonder is, Two things you mentioned that were essentially new. Um, you may have mentioned more, but two I want to focus on. One is upping the capital requirements in the repo market, and the other is potentially looking more carefully at capital monitoring large hedge funds. Now, there are people who would argue that Neither of those was truly the source of the problem in 2008, 2009. That some hedge funds blew up, but they didn't do much collateral damage. That the repo market seized up, but that was because of other things. That maybe we should just ban non-market mutual funds. I mean, how, what made you decide that these were the targets that you think need the direct action? The broker dealer. The broker dealer aspect of these large firms and the hedge funds were the part were the things that need greater scrutiny. Um, I th I've been looking at this for a while to go back to 2008, and I think 
I want the market to be efficient and uh, truly uh, reflect the cost of uh, using certain types of products or certain types of services. So to some degree, what I'm arguing for is better disclosure so that different market, market participants can uh, have fiscal discipline that's either imposed by themselves or by other players and uh, maybe make different choices than they did in the past. So I think we saw that with credit cards and mortgages and short-term funding, that the cost of all those products wasn't necessarily accurate um, and that there was an overuse of them. So if, from my perspective, the short-term funding markets, uh, maybe the cost of funding has been uh, much too low. I think I'm really arguing for transparency more than anything else. Great. Second question, um, as you know, this is the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and your mandate is domestic, and obviously what happens in the U.S. market sets the tone for the rest of the world, both in practice and legally. But many of us, I think myself included, are less aware of how the coordination goes among, say, securities regulators rather than, say, the very famous FSB efforts on banking and Basel this and Basel that. Could you say something about where you feel um, there are divergences between what the SEC is doing in some of these areas, particularly with respect to repo markets, and that practice in, say, Europe, and whether your proposals would push us towards greater convergence or would make the U.S. stand out more. Obviously, behind all this, there's concern about regulatory arbitrage. It's always something we fear. You know, I think the cheese has moved <laughs> um, internationally. Uh, so I think we, we have securities regulators or market regulators who are interacting with one another. And then we have uh, prudential regulators who are interacting with another one another. And then, you know, we have different organizations that are allowing, you know, cross-fertilization as well, just like we're talking about here with the FSOC. Financial Stability Board um, being one of them. I'm an I'm always an advocate for each jurisdiction doing the very best they can do, and hopefully inspiring others <laughs> to uh, incorporate the same best practices, you know, into their legal regime. And I think to some degree, uh, you know, we've seen this with the Dodd Frank reforms as well. There's a, I'll call it a conscious parallelism, you know, going on where some of what we're doing is similar and some of it isn't. But I think we benefit from creative thinking, you know, from different, you know, I sort of believe in laboratories of democracy, you know, much like we have in the States, and we benefit from people trying different things, and then we can see how they work. <laughs> And we can bring them back to each other internationally and see if we can't get to, you know, through memorandums of understanding or colleges uh, to a place where we aren't having the regulatory arbitrage. So I think we should be reaching for the best that we can do and then working with our fellow regulators to do the same. Very diplomatic. Um, no, I mean, it's a fair vision, but, but yeah. nicely put. Um, so, as always here, we will open the floor up to questions. If you're near the front, I'll recognize you and Jessica can bring you a mic. If you're near back, the back, please go stand at the back mic. Uh, identify yourself, and even if you're expressing an opinion, at least try to pretend you're phrasing it as a question to the commissioner. I'm fine with opinions, too. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Um, <laughs> so over there to hope. Um, my name is Hung Tran from the <clears throat> Institute of International Finance, and thank you very much for our very informative uh, remarks. 
you focus mainly in your discussion on uh, broker dealers and at the end a little bit on hedge funds which are highly leveraged and interconnected uh, what is your thinking about the role of uh, asset management companies in the assessment of systemic risk um you know, I I think we should be looking at all possible sources of systemic risk and evaluating whether or not they might pose risk. So I, I believe everything should be on the table, um, and we shouldn't categorically exclude, you know, one type of fund, you know, over another, or one business model over another. My experience is when you do that, people just reincorporate themselves. <laughs> you know, into a new form to get around whatever the exemption, you know, was. So I don't think we're going to know what form uh, systemic risk takes, you know, going forward. It's like the tulip bulb crisis, you know. That bubble was not one that repeated itself. So we're going to end up having a new problem, probably based on a new product, a new way of funding, and that we need to keep looking to some degree where there's a lot of new business being done and uh, see if the, there are issues that end up hurting, again, the fabric of the whole financial system. It, you know, this is an exercise in balancing people being able to take risk and succeed spectacularly well or fail spectacularly, you know, as well without hurting other innocent, you know, players or the entire financial system. Um, at the back and then at the red one. Thank you. My name is Joe Marie Griesgraber. I'm with New Rules for Global Finance, a nonprofit organization. And I wanted to get into the, the weeds of <clears throat> domestic politics or, if you will, of regulatory processes and ask you about the part of the reason why the, the Dodd-Frank bill has not been implemented. From the outside, it seems like there are a lot of uh, interested parties bringing in court cases and say, so on. Do you have an interpretation and do you have a way to move forward so that interested parties can both speak their piece without grinding the process to a halt? That's an impossible question to answer. Um, I, I, I think it's complicated. I think some of it has to do with who are, uh, regulating products and markets that haven't been regulated before. And it is taking more time. And it's taking more time to conceptualize what it should look like and then to get comment from everyone who might be affected by it and understand the effects of making certain choices. That being said, I think we could go more quickly. I think we could do this, uh, you know, be more aggressive, and I think we need to get it done. So I'm going to say what I said in my remarks. We need to get this done. Despite lawsuits, despite lengthy notice and comment, um, we need to get it done. Alice Rivlin, the Brookings Institution. Uh, thanks for a very uh, clear and courageous talk. As you talked about your first point, very forcefully, uh, how the uh, disparate regulators ought to work together, uh, and uh, you were exhorting them <laughs> to do so, but it um, reminded me that we did have a big chance uh, at the time we were formulating uh, Dodd-Frank uh, to uh, get beyond the fragmentation of our regulators, and that was in the, the Dodd bill, as you remember, uh, and have a consolidated regulator. Um, we didn't do that. Do you think that the FSOC can function uh, to pull the regulators together, and what will it take to do that? I think it can, um, Alice, and it should. Uh, but I think it takes people being willing to see that there's a common mission 
across these different regulatory agencies and um, pursuing that. It's hard. It's always been hard. But for the first time, we have a forum for people to come together on a regular basis and talk about new and emerging risk that they might see, you know, from their perspective. So I, I think we need to do as much as we can with what we have and, uh, you know, go forward. Next. Uh, those of you over there can go to the back mic. Uh, just go across this gentleman here. Yeah. Thank you, Tony Elson, Johns Hopkins Size. I wonder if you could comment uh, about whether you think the procedures are in place uh, for the um, OLA uh, authority of the FDIC for the resolution of a large non-bank financial institution and the cooperation with the SEC for such an undertaking. I should, I should uh, refer to Tom here, uh, Honig from the FDIC. He's on the board. Um, you know, I think this is a work in progress, and I think people are working very, very hard to uh, to every, you know, I think every time one of these plans is submitted, to uh, move the ball forward. This is complicated too, is how do you take a big interconnected global firm and basically liquidate it? So I think we're, we're making all the right steps in the right direction and we need to keep working on it. Tom, do you want to add anything add? or you're happy with that? <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd give on it a On the record. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, at the back right. I'm Ted Murphy from CRS. I want to thank you for your speech and also the hard work you did in 2008. I'd like to focus a little bit on crisis containment instead of crisis prevention. And uh, do you have any thoughts on whether or not the SEC already has the authorities it might want or need for a crisis containment stage as opposed to rules that are intended to prevent the next crisis, actions that the SEC might either want to take or avoid taking during another uh, situation in which capital markets aren't functioning correctly. Can you give me an example, Ted, of what you're thinking about? <clears throat> sure. There's um, so many things we regulate. So well, I was going to leave it open so I didn't direct you, but uh, examples would be, for example, uh, in summer of 2008, I believe that there was designation of about 19 or 20 firms that you couldn't do uh, short selling on under certain circumstances for a brief period of time. In every crisis, there's pressure to not have mark-to-market -market accounting or at least uh, give suspensions of certain uh, accounting rules. And those are all places in which the SEC either could uh, act or might ask Congress for the authority to act. But, I'll, you know, I'm not trying to direct you anywhere, but just leave it open. A few good CRS ideas. Um, we, we have broad exemptive authority that we can use in a variety of situations. Um, but I do think it's going back to what we recently went through. Prevention is the best medicine because by the time <laughs> you get into a crisis, your, uh, the tools that you have at hand are somewhat you know, limited. But I'm all for more uh, crisis containment tools you know, as well. And we you know, look forward to talking to you about that. Um, can I just follow up on that a sec before I go to Bill? Um, going from the very specific to the sort of abstract, you know, you, you make the point, and as a lawyer you're better suited to make this than I am, that the SEC, as you're proposing, and already in fact, is moving from a neutral on failure to a not wanting systemic failures stance. But I mean, there is essentially a legacy in the banking system that many would argue that's what leads to too big to fail, or at least that starts you down the road to too big to fail, because you're you're saying, well, we, we don't want to think about certain institutions collapsing. We may put more capital on them, we may put more monitoring on them, but in the end, we are we are acknowledging that we really don't want to think about a huge BD going down. Obviously, you've decided on net 
that's okay. But but is there anything you think should be done to mitigate the sort of too big to fail incentive now for big broker dealers to say, ah, the SEC knows we're important and therefore we can take advantage of the situation? No, I, I think I want. I don't know if I want to be quoted on this, but you know, I want a big BD to be able to fail. I want a firm to be able to fail. I don't want it to be able to take lots of innocent bystanders down. So I think the project is the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you have to balance. Mm -hmm. It goes back to your opening question about what the costs and benefits are. But I think we learn. I learn from the last financial crisis that when a large BD went down, it can affect <laughs> the entire financial system. And we have to look at it differently. Sort of the cheese has moved. <laughs> we can't look at it the way we did before. And I think we, uh, you know, this goes to interconnectedness too, which goes to Ted's uh, containment point as well. Cause Part of this is, are you too interconnected to fail? And we need to be thinking about that and how we make sure, again, that a firm can fail without bringing the financial system to its knees. But, I mean, it is interesting. You're going down a line, a very well argued, not just by you, respectable line about capital and monitoring. But as on the banking side, you know, there are people who say, well, actually, what you need to worry about are activities. You need to, to ban certain activities. You, you've got to get rid of prop trading or whatever it is. I'm not hearing any element of that in what you're proposing. And so... No, I, I think firms should be able to take whatever risks they want to take. But I think when we, we should all be focused on, if a, you know, it's long-term capital management, mm -hmm. right? To the degree we have to step in right. at some point. Taxpayers have to step in. We should have some pause. You know, we should try to do everything we can, you know, beforehand to make sure that doesn't happen again. Thanks. Bill Klein here at the Institute. Uh, my colleague Joe Gagnon and I, a few months back, looked at the solvency issue in the uh, rescue of Bear Stearns, AIG, uh, Fannie and Freddie and concluded that what was done with Lehman followed Badgett's principle, which was that we estimated it was insolvent to the tune of 100 to 200 billion, whereas all of the other four were solvent. So you lend uh, to provide liquidity. And we concluded that because the damage was so great for the economy, the lesson was not that Lehman should have been bailed out but that there should have been some provision for orderly resolution. So my question is whether after this period of time we are any closer to an infrastructure for orderly resolution. It was a thought experiment if Lehman were to uh, occur today, how would we be better prepared to have a hundred billion dollars of losses parceled out in an orderly fashion that did not bring down the rest of the economy. I think you're exactly right. Um, uh, and that sort of goes to the point you were making. It's about, it, to some degree, the same project the SEC was focused on um, and has historically been focused on. I think we need to learn both from what the FDIC has been doing and be thinking about that you know, ourselves. Because I think at the end of the day, how can we, we need to make sure these firms can fail. And uh, I think part of that is, uh, you know, these sort of resolution documents that we're asking, you know, people to provide. I'd admit that's, that's, that's an area where I, I personally am a little less reassured than some others, but hey, um, at the back of my piece. Yeah, Colin Bradford from the Brookings Institution. I'd, I'd like to build on what Alice Rublin asked you and how you responded and see if I can't press that issue forward a little bit of the silos and how you break that. 
Uh, so I'll, that leads me to the question that it's built on some observations I did at, of, the, of the IMF and what has happened since the crisis of the IMF. And you could say briefly that the IMF came from having too few products to oversee financial markets to too many, and that there isn't either a synthesis report that brings them together, nor possibly a locus for decision making that enables regulators and overseers to, to see the whole as well as the parts. So the question is that I don't know the answer to, is there enough evidence in other countries' experience? Adam, you've, you know the English experience intimately, where the governments have a single authority to bring the threads together see them as in their parts and in their whole, and then take decisions to force integrated assessments rather than adjust to the political realities that everybody wants to be the chief of their own domain. I think that was your question. Really? <laughs> oh, darn. Um, just to answer quickly, although I'm a little confused calling by the IMF reference, because I don't think of them as a financial regulator, more as uh, well, anyway, um, I mean, clearly this is something that's shifted back and forth. So the UK has gone to both extremes. Uh, a dozen years ago, they pushed regulation out of the Bank of Supervision, out of the Bank of England, and then fragmented the regulation further and had something even more scary than the FSOC, which was called the Tripartite Authority. And we all know that did not go very well. And so we, the UK now has a much more unified, uh, some might argue centralized authority within the Bank of England. It doesn't cover everything, but it covers an awful lot, not just banking system. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, European Central Bank is making a, if things go forward as planned, is getting a massive centralization again, heavily bank-centered, but in continental Europe, so many of the activities that we care about are transacted by universal banks. So de facto, a huge amount is being centralized in Frankfurt. And, you know, in the U.S., we have, for a variety of historical reasons, the view and Kara and others in this room and Simon can talk about far better than I, you know, have always had state-level regulators, different regulators, um, and with everybody's teeth gnashing about Dodd-Frank, it is a reflection of our political process that there wasn't more consolidation of regulators here now. And I should shut up and let somebody else ask some more questions to Kara, but just to say, that's why she mentioned my recent remarks about tools for the Fed, and that's why I raised my fist in solidarity when her speaking about tools for the SEC. I, I think whatever your views on regulation, and supervision, it is a fact that the regulators and supervisors in the U.S. actually have much smaller toolkits than most of their international comparisons. Now, that again may reflect going back to Andrew Jackson, the way Americans want their government to be. But speaking as a technocratic sort of person, I'm not sure having an empty toolkit is a good idea, which is where I am. Which is a good quote. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd say, I didn't say speaking as a handy person, because then I'd be lying. Um, does anyone else up here want to ask us, please? Hi. Um, for me, Could what I've seen... Sorry, person? David Kim Thorne from CJ. Um, what I've seen is that at the heart of the tension between regulators domestically in FSOC and internationally at the FSB has been arguments around how to govern cross-sector uh, cross financial market risk. And so I just wanted to ask you, to what extent do you think that FSOC securities regulators have done an effective job of understanding the interrelationship between banking, securities, and insurance markets, and um, whether they have decided how to share the regulatory burden appropriately? I mean, this is a work in progress. To go back, is, is this is Alex's question again. I, I think this was our attempt to do that. 
and for the first time, especially on the insurance front, uh, have a group of regulators working together and beginning to better understand uh, the interconnections between all of these markets. As we all know, market participants don't look at these things separately. So it's, it's an attempt to have that type of lateral thinking and for people to start to understand, for example, there was a Fed paper that just came out from San Francisco. San Francisco Fed talking about it was an algorithmic paper, but it was basically talking about how uh, bank holding companies, insurance companies, uh, BDs, and hedge funds were interacting in the short-term funding market, and how a shock to the system might uh, affect the system differently depending on which of these entities the shock came through. So I think through the Office of Financial Research, which is tasked with thinking and writing uh, about uh, systemic risk, uh, through the council itself, which is tasked with the same set of issues for the first time, we're asking our regulators on the national level and, the, and international to be, be thinking across these arbitrary jurisdictional, you know, boundaries, which are historical, you know, in our country. So I think we uh, need to take this paradigm and do the best we can, you know, with that project. And then I'm, I'm always a believer, too, maybe from years of legislative work, is, uh, you know, you figure out what's not working and you fix it. You know, we, we go forward and we see what is working and what isn't. And we uh, go forward with the next piece of legislation or the next, you know, way of looking. So now, you, just because I, I want to respond to David just very briefly in light of Colin's previous question and and, and something Commissioner Stein said. You know, Kara said earlier that she she just said that the markets don't see any distinction between these firms and that earlier things transformed and things. I, I got to say that that's one place where I actually do view the data a little differently. I, I, I do think there are some limits on the amount of transmogrification, to quote Calvin and Hobbes. Um, uh, and, and that, and this goes back to the question of do you regulate activities or do you regulate capital? It's, I, I do believe there are certain kinds of activities that are more or less different. And so I guess in, this is a long-winded way of saying I want to qualify a bit my response to Colin that while in general I'm in favor of centralization and I certainly am in favor of having enough tools for the job, there is some institutional knowledge and differences in the different regulators. And I, I know you're not disagreeing with that, just since I was the one, I just want to be clear. You know, there, there, there are some issues going on right now because people with bank regulatory mentality are looking at insurance companies. And because the Europeans have top level insurance regulators out of Brussels, and we have 54, a college of 54 regulators. And again, that's not to say there's no risk in the insurance industry, but just that there is some room there for acknowledging there are some differences in some specific content that you have to take into account. Anyway, um, Lee, do you want to head to the back back, or can Jessica reach you? No, Jessica. I'm Lee Price with the FDIC, but this is a question based on my dealings with the SEC as an appropriator in 2009 and 10. And you're talking about insurance expertise and banking expertise. The SEC expertise as of 2008, 2009, in my observation, was how do we have the best informed investor? And we had tough enforcement and a huge staff that was geared toward that. And they really did not come to the table with expertise on financial stability. And they, and so I was interested in how you, you, I suspect it's not an accomplished fact that you've got all the expertise that you would like in dealing with. And I would like to get a better sense of how you think it's shifting a big organization like that to be able to have the expertise to deal with this and how, how far has it come and how much further does it have to go as an institution to, to take on that expertise with, and, and change the, 
the emphasis and priorities within the organization because I suspect that if it had the expertise and the orientation, it wouldn't have taken four years to deal with the money market funds. And part of the part of the challenge of dealing with financial stability within that organization is the history that started with and had in 2008. Um, that's challenging to answer me. I, I think I, I have found in the my many years of looking at every regulator, there's a culture at each regulator. And I would say most of them have not been especially focused on systemic risk, which is a relatively new concept. And to some degree is a testament on how global and interconnected our financial system, you know, is now versus, you know, even uh, a couple of decades ago. So I think I'm arguing that we do need to be focused on uh, systemic risk and that we, of course, need to build up the expertise. And I think at the same time, uh, the Office of Financial Research, one of the ideas behind that was to have the expertise that would be provided to all of the regulators and be able to provide that support you know, mechanism. Uh, so. You know, I I would argue every single one of the regulators at this point, and I I've seen a lot of progress um, in every single one of the regulators. It's having a group of folks who are now you know more focused on looking across the financial system. So I think it's a work in progress, but I I do see more. I I think we've reached the end of our time, and I hope you all join me in acknowledging what was a terrific presentation, but also engagement by SEC Commissioner Karasai. Thank you so much. Thank you.